Hi, good evening, guys. Um, welcome to Space Store Live. Um, I can see the participants rolling in now. Um, so we're just going to give about um, around five minutes for everyone to join us, uh, so everyone can get comfortable. Uh, Remco, are you okay? You good yeah, there? All good. I'm good to go. And uh, yeah, I think we should give people some opportunity to uh, to join. I see, the room is uh, is filling up. Brilliant. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us, uh, just a quick mention that will be starting in a few minutes, uh, just giving uh, a chance to those of you um, who haven't joined to join. Brilliant, I can see everyone's here now. Um, so thank you once again, everyone, for joining us uh, on Space Store Live. Um, this is the first of our talk sessions uh, with Space Store Live, and hopefully we'll be continuing these um, every every Thursday evening. Um, my name is Laksh, and I've been working with Space Store for about a year um, as an engineer. And um, today we are joined by uh, Remco Timmermans, um, on um, these talk sessions. And for those of you who may know, uh, the very first Space Store in Didcot has actually been running these talks um, since last summer, um, successfully every Thursday, and we've had a range of speakers. And we've actually taken this opportunity um, to kind of shift these um, talks digitally um, so, we can, so we can reach more people and uh, you guys can learn more about space. Um, a little bit about Remco. Now, Remco is actually a social media specialist for space, um, and he's traveled the world to places like USA and Russia and watched rocket launches firsthand. Now, I'm not sure how many of you had the, have had the opportunity to do that. Um, I certainly haven't. Um, so I'm going to pass this to Remco um, to introduce himself a little bit and um, tell the audience about um, what we're going to be talking about today. All right. Well, thank you very much, Laksh. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't be in the store today. The, the plan was to uh, do this live in the store and then reality kind of took over. So uh, uh, hopefully I'll be able to see uh, you and uh, many in the audience live uh, in the Space Store here in Didcot uh, later. But uh, today we're going to go on a virtual journey. And actually the topic of, uh, of, of the talk today is literally a virtual journey, which is uh, it's really good to do uh, as the first virtual Space to a Life talk. So uh, I'm really happy to uh, to be able to kick this off for you and uh, well take all of you on uh, a virtual trip that we all so desperately need. So uh, without further ado, I hope you can see my screen. Is it all working? I think it is. Um, let's kick off. Awesome. Very good. Let me see how I can proceed the slides. There we go. So we're going on a journey to Baikonur Cosmodrome, the place 
where global space flight began. And uh, I don't know how many of you uh, are, are hardcore space geeks. I'm sure there's, uh, there's quite a few. Uh, you know all the stories um, about Sputnik, about Laika, about Gagarin, about Tereshkova. And if you are like me, it's always been something in my mind as uh, something far away and something very deep in history and hidden far away in, in uh, a remote corner of the world. Um, but uh, when I got the opportunity in 2011, well, not the opportunity, when I uh, found out that one of my countrymen, I'm, I'm Dutch myself, was going to launch to the ISS uh, in 2011, um, and I found out that there was the opportunity to uh, go there and see him depart live. I, uh, I didn't really hesitate uh, much longer and uh, just jumped in to this unknown adventure. Um, so today I'm going to take you on, on a similar journey. I'm going to take you on my journey, but I'm most of all going to take you on the journey that um, astronauts and cosmonauts take um, to the last place on Earth before they go to space. And, and until today, since 2011, when the Space Shuttle program in the US stopped, um, until today, this is the only place in the world from where all international astronauts uh, travel uh, to the International Space Station. Um, that will stop hopefully on the 27th of May when the US will uh, commence its crewed space program. But until that date and until that has happened, um, for almost 10 years, Baikonur Cosmodrome was the gateway to the International Space Station. A very exciting destination uh, with a lot to see. So uh, without further ado, uh, let me introduce you uh, myself a little bit. Laksh uh, introduced me a little bit, but uh, my name is Renko Turmans. As I said, I'm, I'm Dutch, but I live in the UK. I live in Harwell, uh, which is uh, uh, a very important place for space uh, in the UK and in Europe with 105 space companies here on our space campus just around the, around the corner. I, I'd almost say pointing into nowhere uh, from where you're sitting, uh, but very close to here is Harwell Space Campus in Oxfordshire uh, in the UK. Uh, I do social media for space and events uh, through my own company, 70 Media, uh, helping out space uh, organizations, NGOs, companies with marketing outreach, uh, what have you, on social media. And I'm sure that quite a few people uh, out here in the audience uh, have noticed my social media presence where I do talk about space uh, quite a bit. Uh, I'm also the CEO of the Space Up Foundation where we organize Space Up on conferences, next one, virtual one, unsurprisingly, on the 29th of April. So uh, check out uh, Space Up Conf, you can see at the bottom of the screen on Twitter if you're interested. Uh, and I'm also one of the admins of uh, the Space Agenda, where we try to keep track of all space events. So go to space, spaceagenda.com to find out where the next webinar uh, might be. Um, but we're not here for sales pitches. We are here to go on a virtual trip to Russia. So uh, let's go. So first of all, where the hell are we going? We are going to literally the middle of nowhere. We're going uh, to a place in the steppe, in the semi-desert uh, area of southern Kazakhstan. Um, this place is super remote. It's one of the most remote places that I've ever been. And if you look at the map here in Google Maps, you can see that there really isn't much. If you zoom in, you see some villages and some things popping up. But uh, the reason Baikonur Cosmodrome is here is that there is a lot of nothing. It's a great place to launch. Now you also have to remember that in uh, the days that Baikonur Cosmodrome was built in the 1950s, uh, Kazakhstan was part of the uh, Soviet Union. And uh, this is one of the most uh, southern spots in the uh, Soviet Union, in the, in the former Soviet Union. Um, and as we all learn in um, space flight, the further south you can launch your rockets, the more um, um, speed acceleration you get from the rotation of the Earth. So you want to be close, as close to the equator as possible. And in the case of the Soviet Union, you wanted to be as far south in the country as possible. But there was another um, issue in the 1950s, and that was called the Cold War, because these programs in those days were highly secretive. And uh, the enemy, mostly the US and the West, uh, was not supposed to know that the Russians were actually uh, working on this because uh, the early days of space flight was very much related to, uh, to the military evolution and the, the evolution of military equipment, mostly intercontinental uh, ballistic missiles, I ICBMs um, that would carry nuclear 
uh, weapons uh, to the enemy. And of course, the place where you want to launch these things uh, should remain uh, secret. So in the early 1950s, and this is a, uh, a photo of an old German language map of the Soviet Union, uh, you see a town called Baikonur here circled in, in red. And Baikonur is an, was uh, an ancient early 20th century mining town in the middle of nowhere in Kazakhstan. Uh, about 400 kilometers north of where the Cosmodrome was built. And they picked the name Baikonur as one of the ways to uh, confuse the enemy of, uh, of where Baikonur was, uh, where the Cosmodrome and the launch sites uh, were, in case someone would open his mouth and uh, use that name, then still the enemy would be, uh, would be confused as to where exactly that was. Um, Baikonur was built in the 1950s. Um, initially purely military uh, to launch uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, but very early on in the Soviet space program, um, it, was, uh, it started to be used for more civil um, uh, uses as well. And uh, as we all know, in 1957, the first rocket launched there. And in, in those early days of space flight, uh, there was nothing there. There was a small Kazakh uh, fishing town um, in those days, and, and this is um, uh, at the entrance of Baikonur City called the Fisherman Statue, although it does depict an astronaut, but it's called the Fisherman Statue to uh, remember uh, the early beginnings of, um, of the Kazakh town of Tiuratam, as it was, uh, as it's locally known, um, which is on the Darsiria River, uh, where a few fishermen uh, started trading. Uh, in, in, in the early 20th century, and this is where the Russians decided to build the Cosmodrome. The reason they decided to build it here is that uh, this small fishing town is on the main railway from, uh, uh, from the heart of, of, of Russia uh, to Tashkent. And that railway line existed and they needed the trains to transport equipment and people and everything into this barren uh, remote place. Uh, when we talk about Baikonur, we talk about two things. We talk about, mostly we talk about the Cosmodrome. The Cosmodrome is a massive uh, area in, in the steppe. Um, it's about 100 kilometers wide by, by 50 kilometers deep. Uh, so 50 kilometers north to south, 100 kilometers east to west. And there is just a lot of space. There is a lot of nothing. Uh, the town of Baikonur that houses all the workers uh, that keep this site going uh, is on the river. Um, as you can see, the, the Kazakh name of Turatam is here and Baikonur was built right outside that place. And this is what the place really looks like. Most of it looks like this. Um, this is a picture in winter. You'll see, you'll, you'll see the season shift back and forth all the time. I've, I've, I've made a few trips to, uh, to Baikonur to see different launches, uh, somewhere in winter, somewhere in summer. Uh, the difference in climate is, is very extreme where the winters can be very cold, uh, the summers can be very hot. Uh, there's very little precipitation, so uh, this is about the amount of snow that you would usually see there. And uh, it's because it's it's far away from any oceans, it's uh, it's usually very dry. But this is what it looks like. It's flat, there's a lot of nothing, uh, there's camels roaming around the Cosmodrome quite freely. And uh, this is what most of the place actually looks like. So it's not filled with rocket uh, launch beds and buildings, but this is what most of the Cosmodrome looks like. This is a map of the city and, and it doesn't really matter what's uh, in, in all these little squares, but uh, the, the red line is relevant right now because um, after 1992, when, um, when Kazakhstan became independent from Russia, uh, the launch site suddenly um, uh, was located in a different country. And the, the Soviets or the Russians at that point had the problem of their main uh, uh, gateway to space suddenly being located in, in another independent country. Um, so what they did um, when Kazakhstan uh, gained independence from, uh, from the Soviet Union in the early 90s is Russia uh, leased the, the territory of the Cosmodrome and of the city to different spots because the, the Kazakh town uh, uh, is, is right in between the two, um, but they leased the grounds and they built a border fence around it, a border wall, uh, with gateways and uh, they pay the Kazakh government uh, every year uh, a big amount of money um, to, to continue to use both the city and the Cosmodrome 
for the Russian space program. Um, it also means that uh, Baikonur City and Baikonur Cosmodrome is Russian territory. So uh, when you travel there, you, uh, you do have to have special permits um, to, to enter a different country. It's basically a border control when you uh, enter or leave the city. Uh, and again, if you enter or leave the Cosmodrome. Uh, it's difficult to get in there. You do need special permits, so don't travel there on your own thinking that if you have a Russian visa, you will uh, be allowed into, into Baikonur. That's not the case. You need a special permission from Roscosmos, from the Russian space authorities uh, to be allowed to enter the city. Um, Baikonur was built in the 1950s, 1960s. It had its heydays in uh, the 1970s, 80s and 90s. And, and, and that's reflected in the way the city looks like. I mean, this is your traditional Soviet Union main square, which is the main square in Baikonur, where the uh, Lenin statue still stands in the middle of the square overlooking uh, the place as if nothing has changed in the early 90s. Uh, it's, it's really, it very much has the, the look and feel of, of the old Soviet Union still. It's also a space city, and that's the exciting bit about Baikonur, and that's why I love to come back there every time, because it is littered with space monuments. Uh, space monuments like this, this is an actual uh, Soyuz uh, uh, rocket that has been put up on a pedestal in the middle of town. Uh, it's called the Soyuz Monument, um, but it is really a leftover model of an actual early model Soyuz rocket. Uh, pretty exciting to have that in the middle of your town. The local hero is uh, is everywhere. There's statues of him, but also the local tradespeople. Uh, to the right, you see a sign of a, a butcher shop um, with Yuri Gagarin underneath. Um, this this was for the 50th um, anniversary, 1961, 2011. I was there for the first time in 2011, and Gagarin was was everywhere. You can see that this town lives and breathes space and. Uh, be it in Russia, be it in the US, be it in Europe, be it in India, in China, we space people talk to space people, you immediately have this connection. And uh, that is no different in Baikonur. And, and everybody who lives in Baikonur is related to, uh, to space. Uh, so for a space geek like me, it's a pretty exciting place to be. As I said, uh, when you travel between the city where the hotels are and the Cosmodrome, you cross the border uh, several times a day. This is one of the border checks and there's there's loads of checks checkpoints um, but unlike what you may think it doesn't mean that you are kept away from things and that security is very tight security is tight but in russia once you're in you're in and uh, you will see a theme in this talk is that uh, you get really close to the action so uh, let me speed up a little bit because there's uh, there's a lot to go through in uh, in half an hour to 40 minutes this is where it all began. This is in the middle of the Cosmodrome. These two houses were built in uh, the early 1960s for the uh, big Russian space engineer, uh, Korolev, and uh, Russia, and indeed the, the, the world hero, Yuri Gagarin, uh, that they spent their time in before uh, Gagarin's flight in April 1961. And it's now open to visitors, uh, and not just to visitors, it's tradition that all the crews who are about to launch to uh, to the space station, or uh, or in the 70s to the the Salyut space station, to, to the Mir space station, uh, visit Gagarin and Korolev's house uh, before uh, their flight, uh, sit behind uh, his desk and and sign the book. So you can actually enter Gagarin's room, and and they've left it as Gagarin left it on the 12th of April 1961. This is where he spent the night before his flight. His uniform is in, in, in the wardrobe. His bed is neatly made with the 1961 uh, sheets on it. And this room has remained largely untouched uh, since Gagarin left it um, to go uh, in, in, uh, into space in 1961. And it's open for visitors now. You get really close to the action. It's not difficult to get, it is very difficult to get into Baikonur, but once you've got the permits and once everything is sorted, you get really close to the action. And I've, I've seen launches in the US where uh, there's no way they would let visitors um, get this close to the actual hardware. So once you're in, 
in in Baikonur, you're in and you, you, you get to see everything. And this is pretty cool to see the rocket, uh, the traditional rocket rollout that started with Gagarin. Um, in, in six o'clock in the morning, they roll out the rocket uh, a few days before the launch, um, just like Gagarin's rocket, which was the same model. This is a Soyuz that uh, was launched, uh, this picture's from 2014, that launched uh, Alexander Gerst to the ISS with his crew. Uh, the rocket, although it has been uh, going through continuous development, this is still the basic model uh, that Yuri Gagarin used. And, in fact, that Sputnik used in 1957. And you get really close to it. Uh, really cool to see this early in the morning uh, on a big train, uh, the complete uh, Soyuz rocket stack rolling from the assembly building to the launch pad. Great way for great selfies. I mean, where in the world can you take selfies like this? So uh, great opportunities. Uh, I use this picture quite a bit, as you can imagine. And uh, and here she goes. And this is th this picture from 2014. Uh, I used it to advertise this event. Um, is uh, uh, Alexander Guest rocket rolling to launch pad one? Uh, there's lots of launch pads in Baikonur now, but launch pad one is the one that was used by Yuri Gagarin. And I don't know if you can see it, but in the lower right hand corner, uh, it says in Russian Gagarin start. And that is the the name they've given to uh, to launch pad one um, that is still in use for crewed launches uh, today. And this is quite an emotional moment if you're there for the first time, or if, well, even if you're there for the second or third time. It's it's as a space geek, this is holy ground. Uh, entering the gates to uh, to launch pad one, that uh, as it says here on the on the sign is. Uh, is quite emotional. Things have changed a little bit, but the location and the, the way the pad is structured and is, is built is still roughly the same as what it was uh, all the way in the beginning. So once the, the, the rocket has, uh, uh, has arrived at the pad, uh, they will use this special train carriage to put it upright. And uh, well, as you can see from the position where I've taken the photo, they, they let you uh, see all these things from really, really close by. Once the rocket is upright, uh, you see the gantry is still open, the, uh, the service gantry, but they close it. And, uh, and then it only is reopened uh, just before launch. You also see, and that's what I found interesting, and it was actually one of the astronauts who was there who told me that, you see the rocket is green, but when you see the launch footage, the rocket is white. And uh, I wonder if anyone knows why that is. I'll, uh, I'll come back to that later, but I'll, I'll let you puzzle on that for a little bit. Um, so this is the gantry closing. Uh, and this is this is roughly two or three days before the launch, two days before the launch, I believe, when the rocket is unfueled. It's basically an empty tube, uh, but they're closing it and getting it ready for, uh, for launch. Uh, and again, you can get really close. It's really cool to be able to take pictures like these uh, so close to the action. Another thing that you will only see in Russia, as far as I'm, I'm, I'm aware anyway, is uh, before a rocket flies, uh, it has to be blessed. So this is Father Sergei, the, the head of the local church, the, uh, the Orthodox church, who always comes out once the rocket has been uh, placed on the pad and the gantry has been closed. They, uh, they bring in the priest uh, with his holy water. You can see his assistant carrying a plastic bottle with holy water and uh, the priest is then called in and uh, the, the crew and the family is there and uh, the rocket is blessed in the traditional orthodox way with a, with a swab with water. Uh, and after the rocket has been blessed, the priest is uh, very happy to also bless the assembled press. So everybody watch out for your camera and he throws water on you, which in summer is not bad. In winter, it can be very freezing. Right next to the launch pad is uh, a museum and uh, a museum very close to these traditional launch pads must have the best stuff in the world and and it really does uh, and th this is the, the museum in in uh, building two so building one or zone one is uh, the launch pad building two is the museum and everything that falls back into the step or didn't launch or was used to test things uh, is collected here so the Buran space shuttle that you see here, as, as, uh, as many of us know, uh, is 
it's the Russian equivalent or the Soviet equivalent of the American space shuttle. Uh, they've built quite a few of them. They've built more Russian shuttles than they've built American shuttles, but only one actually flew. Um, and that model is still uh, on the Cosmodrome in Baikonur, but it's not this one. This is one of the uh, engineering models, uh, full scale, full size uh, engineering models that was used and that's now parked permanently in, uh, in the garden of the museum. Uh, but you also see random rocket parts scattered around the grounds here. Uh, and of course the best stuff is inside. Uh, in Russia, they like to put their names on everything. They like to sign stuff. So this is part of the rocket fairing that was used for a launch in 2012 when the Olympics were, uh, sorry, 2014, when the Winter Olympics were held in Sochi in Russia. Uh, and this was part of the launch shroud uh, that depicted the Olympic rings because, uh, I don't know if you remember, but uh, in that launch, the Russian commander brought the Olympic torch on board of the International Space Station and took it back. The launch shroud had the logo on it and that's depicted uh, here. As I said, the, they like to, to, look, to, uh, to sign things. It's a tradition uh, ever since the, uh, the beginning that crews sign uh, all kinds of things. They sign the doors in their hotel. You may have seen that in, uh, in launch footage, but also they visit the museum here and they sign the, 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 the poster of the Soyuz rocket. And when the posters fall, they put a new poster in and they collect more autographs. So all the autographs that you see here are uh, the space crews uh, ready to go to space uh, that sign the poster uh, before they go. And I don't know if you can see, but the, the signature in the lower right hand corner is from Alexander Gerst, the, uh, the European astronaut with the German passport, as uh, Jan Werner always says it, who signed this in May 2014, uh, just a few days before his flight. The museum has, has a lot of interesting stuff and, and it really has way too much uh, to, to show you all of it. And this is not a museum visit, uh, but this is one of the dummies uh, that they launched and they, they have a series of them. Um, one is in the US uh, that was sold in auction uh, in, in the 1980s or 1990s, but this is, this is another one called Ivan Ivanovich. And these are the dummies that they used uh, before they flew Gagarin, before they flew the first human into space, they flew these test dummies to see if all the systems worked. So they launched them uh, on a rocket, ejected them on the parachute, the same way that the, uh, the early Vostok system worked with, uh, with Gagarin, ejected them and see if they landed safely. And this is, uh, this is one of them used in, uh, in, in the days, almost literally the days before they launched the first human into space. This is more like a, a, a grim reminder of the early days of the Soviet space program. They launched quite a few dogs, like I was the first one on Sputnik 2. Um, uh, they launched Belka and Strelka, very famous. And these are two other dogs. And uh, the reason why these dogs are in this picture is this is the capsule that launched them. And not only did they launch the dogs, they also launched a series of other animals that uh, after they safely returned, uh, which in this case they did, they all survived their trip into space um, uh, but when they died of natural causes, or don't know why they died, uh, they brought them into the museum, well, they stuffed them, brought them into the museum and put them back in the canister that, uh, that had launched them. So uh, I don't know if they would do this in every country, but it sure makes for an interesting display. As I said, rocket parts, uh, unlike uh, launches in the US or from French Guiana, uh, rocket parts that fall back after launch do not fall in the ocean and sink to the bottom of the ocean, but they land uh, on land uh, a few hundred kilometers, uh, usually to, towards the northeast, uh, which is barren wasteland. Uh, although there are parts that have been known to fall into, uh, into habited places, but most of them of it falls in barren wasteland and is retrieved by the authorities, uh, well, by the space authorities to uh, to do checks on them. So these are various rocket parts that I'm not sure I recognize, but some of you might, uh, but this is scattered around the garden and, and again, makes for an interesting uh, viewing. Buran, and uh, as I said, Russia, you get to see everything from very up close. So they actually let you sit in the, uh, in the cockpit of the spacecraft and uh, great place for, uh, for silly selfies. In the meantime, while the tourists, like myself, in, uh, in, in some of these pictures, are, uh, are, are 
are happily jumping around the Cosmodrome and, and looking at the history. Uh, the crew is in quarantine, and I thought I'd include this picture because, well, because of what's happening right now, we're, we're all in quarantine in our own special ways. Uh, but of course, before space flight, um, both in the US and in, uh, in China and, and also in Russia, the crews are kept in quarantine the two weeks before they launch and they kept, keep them in quarantine in a, in a special hotel with a few bungalows behind it on the riverside in the town of Baikonur. Um, and you can't visit them for obvious reasons. Um, so um, they are in quarantine until the moment they're ready to go to space. And uh, on the day of the launch, there's a series of traditions that these crews go through, uh, one of which, the, the earliest, is a press conference in their quarantine hotel. So all the press gathers in the hotel where the crew stays in quarantine. So normally you can't enter the hotel, but at the time of this press conference, they let everybody into the hotel. Uh, but the cosmonauts will stay behind those glass screens uh, and with a microphone connection can talk to the press and the family uh, and friends of the crew. And uh, as there are not so many tourists going to Baikonur for these launches, there's usually uh, spots for, uh, for the visitors um, as well. So here they are, the crew, not just the crew, also the backup crew is always there because until the moment they uh, get on the bus to the launch pad, the backup crew is there to take their place in case uh, one of the prime crew uh, gets sick and uh, they talk to the press and get ready to go. So a few last pictures behind glass until they are ready to go. Before they go, they go through quite a few ceremonies. Uh, this is one of the ceremonies that uh, the Soyuz crews go through uh, before their quarantine, of course, and that is uh, a tea ceremony at the museum in Baikonur town. And every crew has uh, a picture of them in traditional Kazakh clothes uh, doing the tea ceremony in this special room uh, in the town museum. And if you ask politely, um, the museum crew, if there's nobody else, will gladly let the tourists do the same tea ceremony wearing the exact same clothes, which uh, again is a nice way of getting close to, uh, to these strange customs or these, these interesting traditions that, uh, that they have in Russia. So this is me and two of my friends who were visiting them uh, doing the tea ceremony in exactly that same place, wearing those same clothes. Uh, in the museum here, uh, again, where they keep various interesting uh, items like this, uh, this ILS launch shroud that they uh, retrieve from the step. Uh, the pointy bits of the Soyuz boosters, uh, a wooden fin. Do you know the Soyuz rocket uses wooden fins? Uh, so it's a wooden fin uh, and an original ejection seat from Buran. Interesting collection. There's another place uh, not far uh, from, from the museum in Baikonur town. It's called the Chelamai School. And it's, uh, um, how would I compare it? It's, it's sort of a technical college for the kids um, of the space workers that is focused on science and engineering and obviously on space engineering. And this is a flown Almaz uh, capsule uh, of the TKS system that was connected to the Salyut um, uh, space stations, which was highly experimental. A few of them have flown. Uh, they say that this one has actually flown without crew on a test flight, but it's flown, uh, docked with Salyut and came back to Earth and is now located here in the school. Pretty cool item to have in a school, if you ask me. And again, if you ask politely, they don't mind if you get on board and, uh, and form your own crew uh, on board this, uh, this piece of space history. Then, as I said, the crew, while they're in quarantine, they've gone through all these different traditions. It's ready for them to go to the, to the launch pad. And uh, this is the moment where the buses are ready to uh, take them to the launch pad. And, and interestingly, you see in the little red circle uh, over there, you see one of the many very subtle, uh, uh, I would almost say superstitious symbols uh, that, that uh, are associated to Russian space flight, which is the, uh, what do you call that? I, I never use that word in English. The uh, the horseshoe, yeah, the horseshoe, uh, hanging on the side of the bus to give the crew uh, to bring the crew luck. Now this is the moment where everybody's waiting and they go out of quarantine uh, and get ready to uh, to go to uh, to the rocket. So this is a few hours before launch, 
when uh, the family of the uh, of the crew comes out and then finally the crew itself comes out of quarantine two weeks walks a few hundred meters through a cloud cheering coughing sneezing and everything you don't really want um, but uh, this is this is Russian quarantine for you and, and I guess those plastic tapes will uh, will keep the bugs away uh, so again you get very close to the action it is very cool so this is the moment that you always see in the press where the astronauts or cosmonauts children get to uh, to tap the window and wave at their fathers or mothers uh, who are about to go to space and there's a whole big crowd of press, of family, of officials, of the visitors who are there to, uh, to cheer them uh, uh, good luck and, uh, and wave them goodbye. And from here, this is in the city, they go to the Cosmodrome for their, um, to put on their spacesuits and to get onto the flight. Um, but before that, as a visitor, you have a chance to visit the actual hotel, the quarantine hotel in the place. You can see the river in the background. And this is uh, a little place they call Cosmonaut Alley. And Cosmonaut Alley is where all the crews uh, plant a tree a few weeks or even a few months i don't know exactly a few weeks before they uh, they 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 depart to the international space station or wherever they go they uh, all the crew members that have not flown before they plant their tree here so every crew member gets to plant one tree these are the new trees of the crew that was launching in 2014 uh, including alexander guest who planted a, a small tree here and this is the first tree that was planted here in 1961 and you can see on the sign if you can read Cyrillic says Gagarin this is Gagarin's tree the very first tree in Cosmonaut Alley that uh, that he planted before his flight in 1961. Then this is uh, um, uh, on the Cosmodrome itself so about 40 kilometers away from the town and this is where the cosmonauts the crew go uh, to put on their spacesuits uh, and this is another spaceflight tradition where they walk uh, across this, this painted corridor and they report ready for flight. And, and this is the moment where the prime crew becomes the crew and the backup crew gets released, assuming the prime crew is ready for flight. So here they come out the door. Uh, I, I found it striking when I saw the, uh, the ad, I, I just have to say this, the ad of the uh, of the Americans. I don't know if you saw the video of the upcoming American crude launch where they talk about this door has been open for American crews uh, going to space and now the doors are reopening after almost 10 years. Well, these are the doors in Russia that, uh, that never closed. And this is the crew, international crew, in this case, a German, a Russian and an American um, astronaut. Um, getting ready to go to space. So here they go and here they report ready to what used to be the state commission in the old communist Soviet days. Uh, it is now the heads of the uh, of the different agencies that are involved. Uh, Roscosmos, uh, the commander is always Russian of the Soyuz, so uh, an official from Roscosmos is there and often an official from NASA and an official from ESA in this case uh, are present at this little ceremony where they basically get the question, are you ready to go? And they say, yes, we're ready to go. And, and they go, basically that. And this is the last moment you get to see the crew because this is uh, the moment that they get on the bus and go straight to the rocket. Um, of course, they, they will not let you very close to a fueled rocket. But on the other hand, this is a photo I took from the, uh, the place where you get to see the launch from, uh, which is 1200 meters. Uh, that's less than a mile from the actual launch pad is the uh, the public viewing site um, that's totally unimaginable in any other launch site in the world that i know I, I witnessed a space shuttle launch from about five kilometers which was pretty overwhelming uh, but when i went here for the first time i, I told my guide listen is, is this even safe uh, being so close to the rocket and uh, they say yeah russian technology it's We've done this over a thousand times. Yeah, nothing has ever happened, at least not here. So we're all good. Uh, but it was a bit scary in the beginning. Again, a great place to take selfies, although the rocket becomes a little bit vague, but a uh, great place for rocket selfies. Uh, also a great place to mingle with the locals. So to meet uh, the people who blessed the rocket a few days before and to meet the backup crew. In this case, this was the backup crew for Alexander Gerst, uh, this is um, Samantha Kerstin-Ferretti and uh, Anton Skaplerov, the, the, 
the Russian cosmonaut, and they watched the launch from the same place where the public watched, watched the launch. So they've been released from duty, and uh, they're there to have their picture taken with us tourists, with us, us visitors. Pretty cool to, uh, to be really part of, uh, of the action there. And then, of course, uh, in this case, uh, at the end of the evening, the moment of the launch, uh, yeah, and, and if you've ever seen a rocket launch, then, uh, then that's really cool. Uh, I, ca I can only recommend it. It's a, it's a very special feeling. It's uh, literally like a sunrise. That's how bright this exhaust from these engines is. It's, it's like the sun comes up. It's very difficult to take pictures of it, at least with the equipment that I have. You see awesome pictures on Twitter and, and on, on different websites of people who make it their profession to take really cool pictures. If you have the more simple equipment like I do, this is the result, but it's, 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 it's an absolute magic moment. Uh, you can watch the video. I made a video of the first, uh, the first trip that I made. It's a 10 minute video uh, on this address, uh, bit.ly slash Baikonur 14. Uh, you can have a look. Uh, if you're interested in more, it's a 10-minute video of my first experience in Baikonur. And this is the rocket going up, and it is like a very fast sunrise, uh, if you look at it through the camera. Uh, pretty amazing, uh, amazing view. So uh, with that, um, I would like to say thank you very much for your attention. I think my time is just a little bit more than up, so, uh, so that's good. Thank you very much for traveling to Baikonur with me. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, and I will actually pay attention to the chat now. Uh, so if you have any questions, then please uh, put them in the in the Q and A box or in the in the Zoom chat. I don't know if anyone can pass. If, if there's anything coming from YouTube, can pass it into the Zoom chat here. Uh, that'd be uh, much appreciated. I'm open for questions uh, from right now. So thank you very much to the Space Store for uh, for hosting hosting this for having me. Uh, make sure you follow. Uh, the Space Tour uh, on Twitter at, at Space Tour UK. Uh, follow me on Twitter if you like. Uh, if you want to read more about my adventures in Baikonur, I do have a travel blog uh, from back in the days when we were freely uh, we were freely allowed to travel. It's called travelsinorbit.com, where you find a travel guide to Baikonur, but also to other space places and other places in the world. So feel free to have a look. And uh, thank you very much. And I'm open to uh, to have your questions. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Remco. Uh, there's actually been a few questions coming in um, from YouTube. Um, and the first one is, how do you get a permit for Baikonur and is it expensive? Uh, yes, the, that's the, the very short answer to that last part of the question. Is it expensive? Yes. Um, However, is it worth it? I'd say yes, 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 absolutely. Um, the way to get those permits, uh, the best way to do it is to go through uh, a certified travel agent. There's a number of travel agents uh, in Russia, in Kazakhstan, but also in Europe um, who are authorized to, um, to organize trips there. The European ones always in combination with, uh, with a local travel agent who, uh, who can issue these permits. Um, it is expensive. Um, a, a, a four or five day trip to Baikonur starts without the flights um, at around 1500 to 2000 euros. Um, approximately the same in, in, in UK pounds, a little bit more in dollars. Um, and on top of that, you have to pay your flight. And that includes a few nights in a very simple hotel. Um, it usually excludes meals, but meals in, in Baikonur are very cheap. Um, so yeah, you're looking at uh, including flights at, at a 3,000 euro trip from Europe uh, for five or six days. Uh, that includes the permit, that includes, uh, a, uh, so, so when you have that permit and you want to visit all these places, you get a, a local guide assigned. You have to always travel with a guide and with a security guard uh, representing the Russian Space Agency. So there's no way they will let you roam around the Cosmodrome on your own, but uh, the good yeah. thing about people living there, they're all space geeks. Otherwise, there's no reason for these Russians to go to Baikonur. If you're interested in space, there's absolutely nothing to do there. Um, so all these people are, are, are intrinsically interested in space and they're always open. 
uh, for ideas and suggestions and, and, and special deals. And, and I noticed the first time I was there, if, if I may, just one little story. Um, when we visited the uh, assembly hall, I didn't have pictures of that, but we visited the, the Soyuz assembly hall where they assembled the Soyuz rockets. And, uh, and they were all looking at us like, who are these strangers coming in here? And until we started to ask questions, they said, well, hang on, but you guys know a little bit of what you're talking about. And uh, that's really interesting questions. So, uh, so then you kind of open up, although I don't speak Russian and they usually don't speak English, but the guide is there to interpret for you. And through the interpreter, you get this connection and, and connections. And when you have a human connection with people that opens doors and uh, first we were not allowed to take pictures, but after we had this very excited discussion about details of the Soyuz rocket and how, how the whole procedure works, then he said, oh, you probably want to take a picture here, do you, don't you, with, with, maybe with yourself. So uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was very funny. Awesome. Uh, there's actually been another question from Agent Fry, and he asked, um, what is the amusement park like? Yeah, I, I saw that question and I wasn't sure what to do with it, but there is, uh, <laughs> there is interestingly on, on the southern side of the city, on the, on the river, there is an old, uh, what, I've, I've been there a few times, what kind of looks like an abandoned amusement park, very much like the, the one that they always show these eerie pictures in Chernobyl. Um, and Baikonur has something like that, uh, built in the 1960s and, and, and I don't know if they're still using it. But yeah, it's, it's one of those eerie uh, Soviet amusement parks with uh, merry-go-rounds and there's a small Ferris wheel and there's, there's these attractions. Again, I've never seen them in action, but they're there. You can go there because in town you can freely roam once you have the permit, uh, the propusk to, uh, to be in Baikonur City. Uh, you're free to walk around as long as you carry your permit and your passport in case the police checks you, which has never happened to me. Um, but you can freely roam around so you can go there and take pictures and sit in America around and be in the 1960s Soviet Union it's it's, it's a bit eerie yeah I should have included some pictures there it's, I can imagine in summer it can be quite nice there's uh there's the river close by to cool down it can get really hot in summer so uh yeah interesting nice. question yeah another interesting one actually and it's actually from um I hope I'm saying this right Lorna Aguilar on YouTube and she's um actually listening in from Chile. So a big shout out to Chile. And her question is, um, are all the cosmonauts and astronauts um, shorter uh, than they actually seem? <laughs> well, I'm Dutch, so for me, most, most people around the world are shorter. <laughs> but uh, no, in, interestingly, uh, I've, I've uh, by the way, hi, Lorna. I, I know Lorna, so uh, thanks for joining. Um, but uh, I, I I asked this question to uh, to Paolo Nespoli, the Italian astronaut. He's quite tall. He's taller than me, and uh, he's about the maximum length, he said, that you can be to fit in the Soyuz spacecraft. But he says for him, it is getting rather uncomfortable because he is very tall. And in the old days, yeah, you had to remain uh, a certain relatively short length in order to uh, to even qualify as a cosmonaut. It was one of the one of the things. And and I think there's still height restriction. I'm sure there's people here in the in the uh, in the audience that, that know better, but there's there's still some restrictions uh, as as far as uh, as length and uh, and weight are concerned. But uh, even someone tall, uh, someone tall like uh, Paolo Nespoli was uh, was okay to fly on Soyuz. Nice. Um, another one. I'm not. I'm pretty sure. I think we have time for a few more. Um, and this is from Adam uh, on YouTube. It's a funny one. I, I hope I understand the question correctly, but. It might, meet, might be to do with the superstitions, as you were talking about earlier, is uh, do the astronauts, um, do they pee on the wheel of the star bus or the Zviazdini before the launch? Is that, yes. I think it's a superstition, possibly. It's a superstition, but it's definitely true. Um, oh, wow. They do. Okay. It's a, it is a tradition. Um, and actually, I've seen pictures of it. Uh, our guide, uh, Yaap Tarai, I don't know if Yaap is, uh, is joining us here. Uh, I saw him active on, on Facebook and Twitter. So if you are, thank you, Yap. I, I owe most of this to you. So uh, thank you for taking us there. But uh, but Yap has has uh, he, he he's uh, an old space journalist who lived in in Russia for twenty years and went to uh, many of the launches uh, over over a time span of twenty years. And and he had even more access than I was showing you now. And he actually uh, took pictures of uh, that traditioning uh, that, that tradition uh, happening. Uh, on the way between 
the place where they put on the spacesuits and, and the launch itself. So uh, yes, uh, it's true. And I've even seen seen photographic evidence of it. <laughs> wow, okay. it's fascinating to see like, even in the place where it's so technical um, and so much and so much precise engineering going on, it's still um, the superstitions are still living on, aren't they? Yeah, but you know, it's it's like Russian engineering. The Russians say if it if 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 it's working, if it doesn't break, then don't don't change it. And uh, it's the same with the spaces. That's that's how they can actually do that because you know they do all the pressure tests and everything, and then to do the tradition uh, at the past, they have to reopen that. Um, <laughs> And they do, and it's just a piece of string around the. the it's, it's like 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 closing a garbage bag. That's how yeah. the, how you uh, how you seal the Russian spacesuits. And wow. if it ain't broken, then don't fix it. And and that's how it works. Fair I don't enough. know if, if all cosmonauts nowadays take part in the tradition, but uh, in the old days it was very much so. Uh, especially now that there's female cosmonauts, of course. Um, I've, I've heard the stories that they kind of stand back, uh, maybe even around the corner when that happens, and they don't take part in that tradition which would be a little bit awkward but uh but yeah so 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 things may be changing and modernizing a little bit there as well but as i said the rocket itself the the, the modern soyuz the the, the soyuz 2.1a which was the the last model that they launched a few weeks ago with uh, the last crew to the iss uh, is is basically a very far evolved version of the r7 intercontinental ballistic missile that launched sputnik and the Vostok that launched uh, Yuri Gagarin. So uh, it's, it's, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, and it works. Fair enough, and it's been working so far. Uh, moving on to another question from Biagio Simini on uh, the Zoom live chat. Hi, Biagio. Uh, it's, uh, he says, uh, Dear Remco, in my trip to Baikonur, as I wrote in my photo book, I had the sensation to live in a place without presence. The city seemed suspended in the Soviet era, while the Cosmodrome seems to be in the future. And he asked, did you feel the same of when you went there? Yes, very much so, to be honest. This is this is very much the feeling that I had there as well. And I, I kind of alluded to it when I said this is this is an old Soviet city. Well, of course, the Soviet Union is long gone and, and, uh, and Russia is, is now a modern country. Um, I, I do think that's the case also because the heydays of Baikonur as a space city, when the Buran program, the Energia program, the Salyut program was going on, it had over 100,000 inhabitants. Now it has less than half. So you see entire neighborhoods being boarded up and empty and, and uh, abandoned. Um, you see very little new things being built there. There's very little added to the city because it's coming to an end. Um, as, as some of you may know, the Russians are building a new cosmodrome uh, within Russian territory in Siberia, Vostochny. And the idea is that, uh, well, they started to launch uh, uh, uncrewed flights from Vostochny uh, already, but the idea is, uh, and I don't know how serious that is, but to also uh, move the, uh, the human space flight program uh, away from Baikonur to Vostochny. And I, I don't know what's happening to Baikonur. The lease that Russia has on the land uh, is not eternal, so, so that might end. So they're not investing a lot in the city. Um, they are investing in the Cosmodrome because um, I mentioned Pad 1. Pad 1 at the moment is, uh, is undergoing uh, modernization, so uh, they're not launching from there at the moment, but they will again soon. Uh, and it's gone through cycles of modernization several times, so, uh, uh, so the Cosmodrome itself is the places that are still in use, let's put it that way, are very modern. The places yeah. that are no longer in use, and that's the thing, you have so much space that unlike what they're doing in Kennedy Space Center, where they're reutilizing uh, the space shuttle and the Apollo pads for new missions, in Russia, they just abandon it and build a new one. Um, uh, so you see all the historic pads where uh, Energia Buran launched. Uh, there have been two or three launches uh, by the Energia system, one with Buran, one with Polyusk, and, and maybe one or two test launches uh, or tests. And after that, it's been abandoned, but it's still sitting there. I visited it and it's quite eerie to walk around the launch pad that's been abandoned since the early 1980s or the late 1980s and that nothing has happened. And then you go to the Proton launch pad, which is hypermodern. Uh, that's where, where uh, the first section of the ISS was launched, which is about 50 kilometers from the Gagarin launch pad, is the Proton, what well, they call it Proton City. It's so far from, uh, from Baikonur City, it's, it's, it's about a two hour, two and a half hour drive that they built some accommodation there as well and they call it Proton City. That's where a lot of industrial commercial launches on Proton are, uh, are being uh, prepared. It's, it's super modern. Wow, okay. Uh, 
So, uh, so yeah, I, I, I completely feel with Biagio that that's, uh, that that's very much the case. And, and what, what the future will bring, especially now that the Americans are launching uh, their own crews from their own soil again. Yeah, I don't know. Time will tell. Yeah, I think, I think that leads perfectly onto um, Ank Kumar's question. Um, and he asks, um, are there any other cities around Baikonur uh, worth visiting during the trip? Yeah, I'd say yes or no. It depends on, on how you define uh, around Baikonur, because around Baikonur, there's nothing. Uh, the nearest city is, uh, is the provincial capital of, uh, of Kiziloda, um, which is, is a small Kazakh city. Uh, it's a province the size of three countries, um, which is not super interesting, but um, the old capital um, of Kazakhstan, Almaty, uh, near the Chinese border. Uh, that's that's uh, one of the oldest cities in Kazakhstan. is interesting. Uh, it's in the mountains. It's, it's, it's a beautiful city right at the foot of the mountains, which was the capital until quite recently when Nur Sultan, also known as Astana, became the capital. And that's an interesting city uh, in the sense that it's in the middle of nowhere. It's in the worst place ever. The summers are super hot and super dry. The winters are extremely cold. It was minus 37 the last time I was there. Um, it's bone dry. Uh, there's nothing in the area, but that's where it's right in the middle of Kazakhstan where the new capital was built. So it's all very modernistic and mega megalomaniac, uh, if you like, but it's, it's, it's an interesting uh, place to visit. So, so I would say those places are interesting. And there's, there's other uh, very, um, uh, how do you say that, uh, surreal places to visit because in the old Soviet days, Kazakhstan was, the new, was, was one of the biggest nuclear testing sites in the world. So yeah. a large part of Kazakhstan was used for the Soviet nuclear program for bomb tests. And many of those sites can be visited nowadays. And, and it's, it's like Chernobyl, where there's still a lot of radiation. Yeah. They let you in and they do these tours, these uh, nuclear ghost tours, they call them, that you can do from Nur Sultan or from, uh, or, um, from Amati. And it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting country. It's, it's very sparsely populated. It's mostly desert and steppe. Uh, there's mountains on the side, which are beautiful. There's the ski resorts. The Olympics were there in Amati uh, uh, many years back and it used to be the testing ground for ice skating and for skiing. But uh, other than that, it's very sparsely populated. It has an interesting history and it's, it's right in the middle between uh, the European and, uh, and the Eastern Asian uh, cultures. So it's, it's interesting from many points of view to go there. All right, sorry. Uh, Ank Kumar just wrote in that he thinks um, it's, there's, there's something called Anthrax Island in Kazakhstan. You might have heard of it. Oh, gosh, no. I've, I've not been to Kazakhstan enough to have heard of that. I guess you have to Google that. Sorry. I, I, I know quite a few very surreal places, but Anthrax Island. Uh, no, I've not heard of that, but I can only imagine. There's, there, there's the, uh, uh, the Aral Sea is, is, uh, is for, for, for a large part in Kazakhstan, if not completely nowadays, which is this, this used to be this inland sea that is completely dried up. Uh, it used to have water, so there's there's these these shipwrecks in the middle of the desert uh, that used to be a port and is now just desert and there's camels roaming around ships. Yeah, uh, interesting stuff. But uh, yeah, Anthrax, I'll have to Google that. I don't know. Cool. I think we've still got a couple more. Um, and James Moore on Zoom asks, "What is travel like to the Cosmodrome, and where did you fly into, and did you drive drive from there?" Yeah. So. So yeah, as I said before, um, Baikonur was built on the place where it is because the railway and the railway is still the lifeline uh, of, of that part of Kazakhstan. So what, I, what I've done, uh, there's, there's several ways to get there. Um, you can only fly to Baikonur on, uh, on, on special charter flights from Moscow. Um, let's fly direct into the civilian airport that's just outside of Baikonur called Kraini Airport. You can fly there from Moscow. I've done that once. Interesting flight on a, on a very old Tupolev. That's like a, a talk on its own. Uh, but I've flown there from, from Moscow. But uh, the other times I flew to, uh, to Nur Sultan and to Almaty. Uh, took a domestic flight into Kisiloda, which has a very small airport. It's one of these airports where you have to wait by the door of the plane uh, that they give you your luggage. Um, and, and they will check the luggage tag to see if you, you actually take your own suitcase, but there's not even a conveyor belt for the luggage. Uh, and there, that's, that's, uh, that's about 200 kilometers from, um, from Baikonur, you take a train. You get on the train and uh, 
you go through the step very slowly on old uh, Russian railway material uh, to uh, to Turatam station, which is the, the local Kazakh name for Baikonur station. That's where you get off just outside of Baikonur city. And, uh, and there, if you have the permit to let you into the city. And uh, you can actually, without any permits, uh, as long as you have a Kazakh visa, you can travel to Turatam. But you just cannot enter the city of Baikonur, but you can go to Turatam and then see the launches from about 30 kilometers distance. There's a few hostels there. Uh, you can stand on the roof, you can stay there, you can stand on the roof and see, uh, see uh, Soyuz and proton launches from about 30, 40 kilometers away uh, if you don't want to go through the hassle to get the permit for, for Baikonur. But, uh, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Um, just, to let, uh, just to let our audience know that we'll actually be extending um, our talk by 15 minutes, so we'll end at quarter to seven instead of the uh, scheduled half past, because we've still got a couple more interesting questions to go okay. through. Um, yeah, brilliant. Uh, one more from um, YouTube, and uh, someone asks, "What's the difference between an astronaut and a cosmonaut?" One, and I think um, a few, a few of the audience who are less familiar with space uh, might be um, eager to know the answers to that. Sure, no, I do, and uh, the answer is there, there is no difference. It's the same. It's just a different language. Uh, uh, it, it is the word for someone who goes to space, and uh, in in the English language, we tend to use the word astronaut. Uh, in the Russian language, they used uh, they used the term cosmonaut for cosmos. So we use astro, which I think is the Greek word for space. Cosmos, the, the Russian word for space. In in China, they're called taikonauts. Many people don't know that, but in China, astronauts are called taikonauts. For the what I think, and I, I don't pretend to speak Chinese, but what I think would be the Chinese word for space. Um, yeah. So uh, it's it's the same thing, um, but it's just a different language. I hope that answers your question on YouTube. Um, and I actually had a question. Um, was you showed a picture of when you actually went into the room, um, Gagarin's room, and it's left, left like that. Well, for 50, uh, 50, over fifty years now. Yeah, it's amazing. How how would you how would you sum up that feeling of um, like feeling so connected with space and yeah, something uh, that? I'll, I'll, uh, um, I'll scroll back to it. Uh, yeah. Okay, everyone can yeah, see what is. I'm um, on about. Yeah, this one. This is what you mean, right? Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, how was that feeling? Yeah, it's, that's, that's the reason why you should travel there, because the feeling is, is a connection with history. And that's the cool thing about going to Baikonur Cosmodrome is the Russians take so much care in, in preserving that history. I mean, they're, they're super proud of their role in, in the space race and, uh, and, and, and their role in current space flight. Um, that they they leave all these things as they are and and you know i always say that that in the us i love the space museums in the us they're the best in the world the americans are so good at, pre at preserving uh, anything of, of of historic value but i found out that the russians are are, are very similar to that and uh, that's the nice thing about working in space working in the space industry um, is that you have this sense of of, of global achievement when you're in Russia, I'm as proud uh, of what Gagarin achieved in 1961, even though I didn't even exist, as uh, what Neil Armstrong did. And, and there's this, this global connection within the space industry that it doesn't matter which country you're from, we're all proud of the shared history. And, and, and the Russians are as proud of their part of that as are the Americans, as are the Europeans, as are the Chinese, as are the Indians. And I, I I, I really like that. And when you go to Baikonur, you, you become part of that. They're very open to let you into all these places and experience that. And that's what I like uh, uh, about experiencing it because this is very much like the space tour. Let's, let's, let's put in a little bit of a, yeah. of a sales pitch for the space tour because the space tour was founded last year to be a store where you experience space. It's not a, not a place where you go to buy space uh items but it's a place to experience space you have the vr experience you have the space suits and, and you can take your selfies against the background very much like what i have behind me uh put on the space and experience space well that's when you go to bike and cosmodrome that's how it feels you experience history and it is it is so amazing to uh to be allowed into these places and to be allowed to share that history with with uh well, with the people who are even closer to it, with with the Russian space engineers, if you like, and it's it's really welcoming. And 
I, it's 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 amazing to stand in this room, basically untouched since Gagarin left. That is that is it's, it's very emotional. Awesome. I mean, uh, I mean, it's absolutely crazy to think that you're actually uh, able to connect with it um, so much. Um, but yeah, I think I think we have answered everyone's questions. Um, I don't think there are any more. Anything um, you wanted to add, to Red, Remco? Uh, no, not really, except the fact that this is all coming to an end. I, I alluded to that earlier. Um, uh, well, right now with Corona, of course, the last launch was a very special one because nobody could be there for obvious reasons. Uh, yeah. uh, there, were, there was no press. The family of the crew was not allowed there and only very few people could be there uh, to, uh, to go through these, these traditions and to go through the procedure as, as we've now seen it. I, I really hope that, uh, well, like, the whole world really returning to uh, some state of normality soon. Uh, I also hope that we will continue to be able to experience some of this and that we, uh, I don't know how this will be once the Russians move to Vostochny. I don't know what the impact will be when the Americans start their program again um, um, from, from Kennedy Space Center, whether this will all remain as it is, because this is, this is Let's be honest, this is in a, in a fragile place. This is leased by Russia. What happens if, if Russia um, uh, stops leasing the territory? Uh, will this all stay there? Um, I really don't know, but I think as a space community, we, uh, we, sh we should keep an eye on this and, and making sure that we help the Russians and the Kazakhs to, uh, well, to preserve this history for humankind, if you like. Uh, I, would, I would really like to see this. I'm, I, I'm very much afraid that, uh, that we have witnessed we, I mean, me and, and the people who have visited Baikonur have witnessed some part of history that uh, that may slowly disappear. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that, um, your experience of um, experiencing that bit of history with us today. Um, and just to wrap things up, I just wanted to say thank you so much um, for, um, for today. And it's been so insightful and so um interesting to learn like go through the journey of, of the Baikonur Cosmodrome and I hope the audience have all enjoyed it um, just to let everyone know that the um, a repeat so the uh, this uh, talk will be available uh, to watch on YouTube on our YouTube channel of um, Space Store Live so if you want to go back and um, have a relook at some of, some of the amazing pictures that Remco showed us uh, feel free to do that um, and I am also very excited to say that uh, we will be continuing these talks on a weekly basis on Thursdays. And we have some very, very interesting um, speakers lined up um, for the next few weeks. Um, I'm not gonna say uh, more about that right now because um, wait for things to be confirmed and we'll um, post them out on, on, on Space Tour Live social media channels. Uh, but thank you once again for joining us. Uh, thank you once again, Remco, um, for such an entertaining talk. Um, and yeah, I hope everyone stays safe, ha has a good evening, um, enjoys the sunshine if um, they're in the UK. And um, we hope to see you um, next week. All right, thank you very much. Bye-bye all. <laughs>